very excited about um, being here with our guests today. We have some really exciting things to talk about, especially one of my own personal um, things that I'm passionate about is how to engage. And um, we're talking with conversationalists, people that are um, behind the brand, that work for, within, and, and, and on the brand, and are looking to uh, figure out ways that they can help to drive conversation and, um, and be as, as engaged as possible. And that's where these three pe people came from that we have today. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit more about uh, the details of that as we go, but um, first and foremost, I wanted to give you an idea as to where this came from. Um, Leadtail, a great research company that we partnered with, uh, he, us here at Pure Matter, got together and we, we took a look at how we could build a research report that looked at um, the behind the brand, the influencers that drive social media for the brands that we love. The brands that we um, admire, the ones that always stand out because of the things that they do that actually gives us a reason to engage back with them. And so I think you'll see over the course of this that um, a lot of the people that are, um, that are looking at um, you know, ways to engage, ways to listen, and ways to um, uh, look at, at, at analytics, that's what we're going to do in this three-part series. Now. Um, what I'm really uh, excited about, too, is how this report came to be. Um, let me just walk you through real quickly. Leadtail and Pure Matter went through and picked 30 brands that we liked, right? Um, we had to start somewhere. From there, Leadtail analyzed 22,642. Um, let's see, I'm getting pinged from people all over the place here. Everybody loves it. <laughs> Lead Tail uh, analyzed 22,642 public tweets published by uh, these influencers that you're going to, um, there's three of them that you're going to talk to here today and uh, hear from. Um, that includes 9,413 links that were shared in those tweets. And we had 3,554 unique hashtags that were mentioned and 8,070 mentioned or replies. That means that 8,000 people, uh, 8,000 replies happened from these influencers. There we go. And so one of the things that I wanted to um, drive through and, and, and uh, help to understand is how we approach this. Um, we looked at the executives. We looked at um, their mix of shares. We looked at how they influenced. We looked at how and analyzed their Twitter handles. All this was done on, on Twitter. That was the best way that we can do uh, a research report with using an open um, social media um, platform. And, um, and then we, we took a look at all of that and categorized them based upon their outcome. Now, the people that you're talking to here today are conversationalists. So we define conversationalists as people who had a mention to tweet ratio of, point, of greater than 0.95, the greater than 1. So that was like a, most of these, especially the three that you're talking to today, have a two to one and, and even greater ratio of responding to people that are engaging, um, which means almost every tweet they publish is mentioned by somebody. And all these conversationalists are regularly sharing links, but at a rate of somewhat um, lower than, than typical amplifiers, they are much more on the conversationalist platform. So that's the topic of today and what we're going to cover. So what I wanted to uh, do first is introduce you to Tammy Conazaro, who's the Vice President of Marketing at IBM. She's driving IBM as the recognized leader in cloud solutions. A um, lot of big stuff on cloud going on right now. Leading a global performance marketing team responsible for the rollout of 16 data centers and a global marketing program to build IBM's leadership in cloud. Not a small <laughs> problem or a small challenge. Uh, she has definitely a lot to uh, accomplish here. And the next person I wanted to um, I wanted to talk um, um, to you about is Lorena Hathaway, um, a good friend and also um, uh, another great brand, uh, Pitney Bowes. She's the director of global product marketing um, in location intelligence at Pitney. Um, she's prom she's been promoted into this position to fully enable Pitney's software sales organization to successfully take the location intelligence products and solutions to market. Also representing the voice of the customer and um, in product management, she's got also a lot of work to get done there at Pitney Bowes. It's no small feat as well. And then last but not least, we have uh, Jeanette 
Gibson. She's Vice President of Customer Experience and Community at Hootsuite, one of my favorite uh, social tools and platforms out there. Um, we're using uh, Hootsuite today to, to um, actually track the hashtag and converse with you guys, um, as it's only fitting that we do that. Um, I lead, uh, or Jeanette leads the, I don't lead, uh, Jeanette leads the global community organization at Hootsuite. So a uh, pretty tall task to take on. The community team is responsible for global outreach of the company's 10 million and growing user base of social media professionals who use the free pro and enterprise social platform. Um, so she's the champion for customer experiences and serves as strategic consultant to customers of all sizes. And, and levels of social business maturity. So obviously um, someone who's helping to evangelize the very category that she is in for this, um, this webinar. So that said, thank you three for joining us here today. I'm going to um, take 30 minutes to ask you guys some questions and, uh, and then we'll move forward. Let's see, hopefully I'm not freezing anymore. Um, can you all hear me okay? Maybe just give me a thumbs up. I think Tammy can't, or I, or I froze on her, <laughs> or she froze on us. Um, so we'll start with Jeanette. Um, Jeanette, why don't we, um, I'm going to ask you here a, a quick question just about being a conversationalist. Let's start off with something uh, fairly um, simple since that's something that you're, you're really good at. What, um, what do you define as a conversationalist and how do you approach being a conversationalist? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here, so I really appreciate that. Um, I'm honored to be part of the report. Um, I think of conversational as someone that is really focused on listening and engaging um, and having those two-way conversations. So, you know, being in the social space, I think uh, it's really exciting to be able to meet so many people over Twitter and feel like we know them uh, when we're really only just tweeting with them. So, um, for me, it's having those two-way conversations and um, I think about how I can share something and add something to the conversation. I think that's one of the things that I've tried to focus on is what unique perspective or opinion do I have if I see a report, do I have an opinion about that, is there a certain part of the report that sticks out to me um, that I want to share. So I try and think about what you know opinion I want to put out there um, and always trying to be interested in what is happening instead of focusing on being interesting. So um, that's something that we go by is, is just be interested in the audience and, and share my point of view. Um, and I, I focus a lot on, you know, if someone's following me or retweeting me, I can look at their profile and see, you know, where they're from, what some of their interests are, and, and try and use that as a way to kind of get to know that person and engage. All right, let's move on to Lorena. Um, Lorena, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for being here today. And I wanted to... Um, I wanted to ask you a question as well about what it means to you to be a conversationalist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think it's creating that sense of community and finding synergy between what I am doing right now and what is relevant for me and what is relevant for other ones. And just having that connection, right? Because sometimes we just push information out or we just retweet information, but when you go and engage with things that are happening right now around you and people are connected with that, I think that that's very meaningful for, you know, everybody who's engaged in that conversation. And I agree that it's like a two ways, right? When you are just sharing and then engaging and then listening and listening others speaking, not only in Twitter, but then you connect those Google Plus world and then you go to LinkedIn, you see that similar conversations are happening. And I think that that is when people really see that you are doing this real time and, and they are relating with that and then becomes, you know, like a massive force. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Tammy, how about yourself? Welcome here, first of all, today. Um, let me switch you over here now to present to everyone. I now have that, that ability to move around here. Let's see. There you are. Um, what do you believe it uh, means to be a conversationalist on social media? Tammy, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Can she hear us? Yeah, I can't hear her either. Let's see. 
How about Tim, now? Can you, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Oh, now I can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So, um, you know, in the early days of social media, you know, I think we treated social much like advertising, where we were pushing out messages um, and, you know, using it as like a micro, you know, advertising platform. But uh, today, I think, you know, we've started to realize that the real power of social is in, you know, as, um, you know, as individuals, as employees, um, and also leveraging our customers and, and myself personally, really working to engage. Um, in your community, and whether that community is, um, you know, a community of employees or uh, customers, to really um, make sure it's a two-way dialogue, and that you're using it to get feedback or um, understand your customer better, or thank a customer, or um, engage someone in a, you know, in a dialogue around your brand. Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, now let me let me go back around again and ask you guys some specifics. What are what are some some um, ways that you find um, you get some real quality engagement? Uh, it goes above and beyond just a thank you. Um, Lorena, why don't we um, go with you first? Okay. So I did some couple things that I found like interesting, and you know. This is like kind of like a game, right? You try things you're not expecting really sometimes to work, but then sometimes people pick up and, and you see the passion behind that. I remember one time one of the products that we had that is a GIS technology called Mavinfo Pro. We did a couple conference and I remember just, you know, having a coffee and, and I took a shot of the coffee mug and I was like, hey, I got this in the conference and then everybody starts sending me different things that they got in different conference. So we start like this kind of like gaming about sharing what you got in conference a couple of years ago. So sometimes something that is uh, being easy and you know like kind of like in a fun way becomes kind of like a trend. We did that also with a, a map contest that we did some from fun and for good and our customers were mapping that. And still today I have some people sending me maps and say hey Look at what I created with, you know, this data and, you know, the technology coming from Pitney Bow. So it's like fun to see that sometimes it's not just retweeting or thank you someone for sharing your information, but also engaging in a, you know, like in a fun way. I think that that's, that's something that I can relate in and I can see kind of like a wave that goes from one side to another one. And it keeps coming and going, right? I love it. I love it. And uh, Jeanette, what do you what do you think about that? I think she, um, making that personal brand come alive, right? By taking stuff that is personal to you and 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 sharing that. And I think um, I think what is most fun is to kind of show your personality. And especially when you're representing a brand, there is that personal brand and corporate brand. I find that events are really fun ways to kind of inspire new ways of people to share their experiences at events and whenever I'm speaking um, I try and think of you know is there a conversation that we want to have or something that is fun and interesting and um, and one of the things that I've seen with the audience is sometimes they will then take a quote of what I've said and put it in a slide and share that on Twitter and I think that's a brilliant best practice if you're at any event where if there's a quote you like to pop a graphic in that and share that um, and I've had some really interesting conversations with folks that have done that the events that I've been speaking at or events I've just attended um, but we had a funny experience when I was um, speaking in New York at one of our user conferences and we were talking about content marketing and I've been speaking a lot on content marketing lately because that's so important for word of mouth and this this colleague of mine had talked about this analogy she uses for content marketing which is the 80-20 rule which is you know, you want to have 80% kind of business content and 20% kind of personal fun content in your strategy. And so we have the analogy for the mullet where we talk about like 80% business in front, 20% party in the back. Yeah. So when I was speaking, I had a picture of a mullet and um, tweeted about the 80-20 in the mullet. So then we got this kind of hashtag social media mullet thing going on. So it just made it fun and interesting. So I love finding metaphors or analogies to kind of lighten up the the mood and kind of inspire engagement um, and get some interesting discussions going. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Tammy, how about yourself? I, I love those examples, Jeanette. I, I um, 
you know, I think we also can use it, you know, as you, as you talk about, you know, fun content and content that your audience is going to like, you know, we use it often as a, as a test. Uh, to, to understand what types of content um, for our content marketing that our customers like to engage with, what do they respond to? You know, do they like um, you know really deep technical um, knowledge? Do they like funny? Do they respond to you know um, silly or quizzes? You know, and, and we actually have been learning, I think, you know, what are a little bit more about our customers through social, how how they like to engage with the brand, and then you know trying to use that to double down as we as we create content or as we create, you know, deeper campaigns. You know, part of part of what I wanted to talk about here today was also how do you drive a personal brand with a uh, your, when you're working for a brand? Um, how do you see the two together? How do you see it working? Um, what's a, what's allowed? What isn't allowed? Um, what why don't why don't you talk me through that at at your brand, uh, Jeanette? Um, so that's a great question. We have. Um, Definitely the acknowledgement at Hootsuite that if you are going to be talking about Hootsuite, um, that you um, look at our social media policies and guidelines and, of course, act in a professional manner. Um, but also it's really important that we have the voice. So we do have kind of the Hootsuite voice that we've talked about, which is to be empathetic to our users and to show your passion for social media and to love what you do. So um, we definitely encourage people at Hootsuite to all share whatever... Um, is appropriate and professional and we actually haven't had any problems with people kind of mixing that personal and professional because our audience are social media managers so you know we, we we make sure that that's available for people to look at the guidelines around not sharing for example you know confidential materials that go internally or you know anything from a QBR I mean that type of stuff is pretty obvious to all of us now but we do ongoing training and education to employees and um, try and do contests and things so employees can share their passions. Um, but I think it's important to understand, like I use Jeanette G as both my personal and my professional. I don't have a Hoot Jeanette, for example, handle. Some people at Hootsuite do. They have a handle with the, the company name in it. But I also um, participate on our Hoot community, on Hootsuite handle, on Hoot business. So we definitely um, have it set up where there's workflow where I can participate in the corporate handles. Um, with the team and then I do a lot of engagement personally and I actually really love that I can engage personally and um, with the influencers and the um, people that are that are in my network I think that's one of the benefits so um, you know if it's corporate information and news we do um, hoop community but uh, for us we really try and help educate people and inspire them to show their personality and and have fun um, so you don't um, it, is there anything uh, at your brand that you need you you can't do is there ways that you have to live within that as a as yourself as if you're out there tweeting on your own are you a representative of your brand or of yourself or both both I think I think the world we live in is you're both if I say that I work for Hootsuite then everything I do I need to recognize um, that I'm gonna be professional and how I interact and embrace you know competitive conversations um, you know I'm, we're always gonna be respectful so you know I use Facebook is my personal platform to share information about my family and my kids. I don't usually post, you know, pictures of my kids necessarily on Twitter. I do that on Instagram. So I think it really depends on the network. Um, so I think I, I really like to engage professionally with colleagues. But we do recognize that if you are engaging in the public, then to be professional, respectful, and, and kind of respect, you know, the code of business conduct, uh, I think that's pretty standard for companies. Great. Thank you. Um, Lorena, how about yourself? How how do you see your personal and your um, business brand? And I'll I'll give it a, just a quick second to to let the um, audio catch up here. But um, how do you see your personal and your your business brand working together? What are the the pitfalls and the challenges, or what are the strengths that you find when you're trying to um, maintain that, those two? Yeah. So. Um my Twitter is my personal brand, and, and, and I talk about what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about marketing. I'm talking about technology. I'm passionate about that. I work in Pitney Bowes. I represent a line of business that is all about location intelligence. That is pretty much 70% of the content that I'm sharing. Uh, we have uh, followers that follow GIS, or our technology, and they're invested, and they're passionate about like sharing those thoughts. So. This has been a great platform for us to learn about them. I think that the company is being um, appreciated uh, 
what, what they're saying to us, so we create content for them based on that interaction. We have an, a really great social media team to help us to train internally, to create advocates, not only for people who work in PV, Pinnibles, but also our partner community. Uh, I think that uh, we as a company, we're embracing more and more social media. We know the power of social media. And I think that um, is it's important to be true to yourself. I don't believe that you need to create a persona. I think that you need to be yourself. Share about where you work, what you do, what is around you, and also what you're passionate about. I love to run, I love to travel, and people know that I'm doing that, and people relate to that, because you know we create emotions, or they have been in my country, Chile, and they wanna talk about it, and I love it. So yeah. I think that we got a lot of help for our corporate uh, social media team to help us to navigate and train people so they know how to do social media and you know what is kind of like the the line that we don't want to cross right but I think that overall everybody's very respectful about what can we do and what we cannot do it's almost like having a, a conversation face to face right you know what you cannot say <laughs> I love it and I know I know we do that all the time so I, I, I can honestly say that that is exactly what you do what um, what are some of the challenges that you see that um, businesses have in helping to arm their employees with being conversationalists? How can they help do what you guys do um, to help them understand what to say and how to say it or uh, how, how free they can be? Um, you know, we've seen all kinds of examples over the last, especially the last two years, where there has been a, um, a pretty big breakdown in communication uh, whether it's on the brand side or on the employee side, um, where how can we get this to be a better place so that employees can feel free to speak and know know how how and what to how and when to do it? Jeanette, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. I was going to say IBM has a lot to say too because they do so many amazing things with all their um, employee engagement. We, you know, one of the things we found is um, employee advocacy is definitely a huge area that we're seeing um, a lot of people talk about and a lot of our clients actually looking at. And you know, one of the things that we've seen, and I think Tam Tammy mentioned this at the beginning that we were all kind of broadcasting. And I think that's been the first phase of employee engagement is have employees amplify you know, corporate news and activities. And I think what we're starting to see now is a lot of ways to create specific engagements um, with employees to share and, and offering them those guardrails so they have a contest or a specific campaign. Um, I partner a lot with our, our talent team uh, for like hashtag Hootsuite Life um, and really talking about how great it is to work there. And so we'll share pictures of, you know, when people are um, attending a meeting or a conference or going to the, you know, local taco truck outside or grabbing a beer after work. So we really try and encourage people to share what it's like to work at the company to give a behind the scenes view. So that's one one really fun way to get employees involved is whatever company to have the hashtag your company life kind of um, hashtag. But then another thing is to is to think proactively about campaigns to engage your employees. And and we did something with Social Media Week um, in September where we wanted to get employees involved in Social Media Week, and so we created a specific contest for them to you know share share your first tweet, for example. And we asked employees to do that as well as of course all of our larger community and it was really fun to see people's first tweets and we did a little contest where people you know were the winner and we would showcase their tweets and um, you know or and then we and then it got into sharing you know some things you're passionate about and some employees shared their favorite charities and how they were able to raise money so I think if you give them some campaigns and ideas so that they can understand how to engage otherwise um, everyone is just amplifying the same news so mm -hmm. I think that's a real good best practice and we're now finding that every campaign we do we sit down with HR and say what is a unique engagement we can do for employees so they can feel a part of it and that is special and then we can create some special rewards uh, for employees internally. I like that I, I, I rarely hear of companies are especially social where they're actually going to HR and asking to partner with them to share. Usually I hear the, the two um, trying to work against each other and, or working in silos. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, so um, Tammy, I think we got you all situated. Let me, let's, let's see if this works here. Um, and I want to go back into um, personal and um, business brand. How do you keep the two separate? How do you keep them uh, um, this uh, coincide. Where do you see them fitting together, especially with your own brand? And you've done a really good job of building up, 
you know, your your brand. But how did you do that, and what what how do you um, how do you see IBM working within that? Um, you know, we try we try to you know make sure that employees understand the IBM brand and our you know our, our overall kind of mission um, as a brand and and you know we do have social media policy guidelines and they were actually created by a community there was an open wiki and people just kind of put their ideas and wrote down what you know what they thought should be IBM's social uh, computing uh, guidelines and which I think is a really nice way to do it because it sort of involved the early adopters um, and, and made it sort of of the people so to speak um, and then we codified those and you know worked with HR and I'm sure legal and, and published those um, and, but they're very you know they are very liberal in terms of you know what you're allowed to um, what you're allowed to do I mean you just don't want to do anything in violation you know that wouldn't you know, that would be against the IBM brand. I mean, it's really some pretty basic human stuff that you probably wouldn't want to do as a human being anyway. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think I agree with Lorena in terms of, you know, you do really want to let your personal, um, your, your personality shine through um, as opposed to feeling like sort of a brand, you know, sort of a, you know, a brand voice, which is, which is actually less interesting. Um, and so the idea is to bring out those collection of individual voices. And, no, I do some soft once in a while. I'll do some kind of soft selling of, you know, our marketing, you know, our marketing tools or, um, you know, different webcasts or marketing tactics. But I really do try to keep, you know, much of the content, um, you know, educational in nature or um, personal in nature or around, you know, marketing marketing activities that I find to be best practices or be valuable to my audience um, in, in really trying to provide value. Great. What so what? How did you? Um, what was the number one thing for you that got your um, your brand up and running as a personal brand? And and how did you, how do you feel? Um, you know that went. Are you happy with how it how it um, how how it went? Well, I think I I think starting a blog was you know helped me to have uh, it kind of helped me I guess to. To sort of codify my own brand, who I was, you know, what my voice was, um, it, you know, as I write my blog, I, I think, you know, if I look back, you know, when I first started it, my my voice maybe or my tone or topics have have evolved a little bit, and um, you know, I think that helps me to have original original content, um, and and also I take some of that, you know, thinking around. I usually try to make it marketing so change, you know, so for changing so rapidly right now. I try to make it about a relevant topic, and then I'll try to keep that theme going over the course of a you know over a month. Um, I'd love to be an author like yourself, Brian. I haven't gotten there, <laughs> but I do think um, you know providing original content as well as being a content aggregator, um, as well as you know engaging with people who are in your community are, are probably you know the three overarching uh, you know principles that I try to keep in mind. Great. And and you all three need to be authors, so that's just going to happen. Um, <laughs> Lorena, um, let me let me ask you here, just kind of flipping back over now that we've kind of caught um, caught up here. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we were talking about uh, was um, how how to how to help employees to be more social. What's your thought on that? So we start this journey, and I think it was a couple. Of two years ago with our social media team again and um, they are the ones driving this and helping us to do this I'm a product marketing person so I am representing my customer right and in my team and the product I think that uh, training right giving the tools to our employees and also to to our partners to help us to just you know put out our technology and our solution is being great just giving the tools giving the training and you know it's like swimming you can talk about swimming for hours watch video guess what you need to get in the pool and do some laps you need to really get and do it so I think that having that and, and getting people to do it and then having a catch-up where they can see tell us what are they doing what is working not working and then we share our learnings it's been really helpful also we start a, a project where we get our sales team now to be more social and I think that that's one of my favorite examples because as a salesperson, right, you say, well, marketing people, they, they should be in social and they're good about doing it. But guess what? Everybody's really good about 
sharing thoughts and being a thought leader, right? You can work in finance, you can work in sales, you can work in any part of the company, even, you know, anything. Now our sales team got very engaged with social media and I love to see that, you know, they try to reach out to someone via LinkedIn or some other um, venues or channels, could be a phone call or like an email and they get no response. But they engage via social and guess what, that person is active, they get right away to that person, that person responds back to them, and then they connect in the other, you know, social media channels or LinkedIn or, or so what. So some people are hanging out in Twitter and you get their attention, you will get their attention in the other social media channels. So I think that it's, it's very interesting to see the dynamic with different groups and also learning and getting back to, you know, everybody on a call and say, look, this is what is working for this group or this region and we all share. So I think that that's been working for all of us. You know, that, that's, um, that seems to be a running trend with, um, with everyone here is, share, is, the, is the sharing. Um, and, and I don't mean sharing socially, but sharing internally like best practices and, and how, to, how to move, um, you know, content through and how to, how to um, actually get people engaged. Um, there's a whole sharing component that I'm hearing from all three of you you know, that happens just internally before it goes externally. Um, but uh, one, you know, I want to make sure that we also have time for questions. Um, we've got questions coming in off of Twitter. We have one from uh, from Sugar Mike, uh, Cigar, Cigar, S-A-G-A-R, Mike. I almost said it was Sugar. Um, and um, maybe I just want a cigar. I don't know. So <laughs> um, his question is, um, isn't personal branding about using social channels to add personality to a corporate brand and build no build like and trusted factors? Let me read that again because I want to make sure I understand it. Um, isn't personal branding about using social channels to add personality to a corporate brand? Using I, I think it's using social channels uh, as as the factors within those. Does that make sense to you guys? So, Janet, yeah, yeah. You know, do you, uh, yeah, go ahead, Tammy. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, I also think, you know, I, I don't think it's just about the corporate brand, right? I mean, in a sense, it's also about your own brand. I mean, I think there is a career aspect to it as well. Um, I think you are a better leader and a better executive representing your com company because you have a social presence. But I, I also think there's a personal benefit to it um, in terms of your own personal you know, uh, learning um, your own personal stature in the community, um, as well as you know, as well as the extension of, of your your brand. And I think it comes into a good topic around thought leadership, right? I mean, because companies can promote their own thought leadership and explore new topics through social. Like I think about with um, with Hootsuite, our CEO Ryan Holmes posts a lot of content on LinkedIn. Um, and really enjoys the kind of comments that he sees from LinkedIn and for us as a brand it's really important for when he posts a comment whether it's about you know an update of what's going on in the mobile industry or what's going on in Brazil for internet uh, and you know adoption then we look at okay are those trends that we should be thinking about as a company so we're looking at those commentary on a lot of thought leadership content we put out there and that's influencing what we say as a brand so I think that listening engaging and responding is really exciting but I, I do agree with Tammy's point that as executives you have a tremendous ability to, to show personality but also thought leadership and that might be on Pinterest it might be on Instagram uh, might be on LinkedIn so I think all channels should be open to brands great great Lorena any thoughts there no, I totally agree. And the only thing I think that you know, it's it's so easy to be true to yourself and and just you show a little bit of who you are, and people and everybody pick up very easily. And then you're like, oh, that person is fun, and they're doing the same stuff that I'm doing. And then you get so many connections, right? And I know that you're traveling from Instagram before you tweet about it sometimes, right? And so it's just fun to just see that. And, uh, and you know we are we know that LinkedIn is a little bit more serious and we all kind of like have an agreement over there but you know that you can be a little bit more playful on Instagram and Twitter mm -hmm. kind of like in between and I think that uh, we all kind of like it and you know Facebook is Facebook and that's for friends and family and a very close group of friends so so I totally agree with both ladies 
Great. Um, I have a question here um, from Linda. Do, do you find that Twitter is the main channel to engage in the conversation? What about Instagram? Um, so obviously that, that uh, tags on to what you were just saying, um, Lorena. And um, why, don't, why don't we have um, you take that, Lorena, since you were just kind of talking about that? Well, I think that Twitter right now is my favorite. Um, and, uh, you know, I never stop tweeting. And I remember, because I've not been doing this for a while, I was so conservative. And sometimes I was just, like, honestly thinking for a tweet for over 10 minutes. Like, what should I say? What should I share? But then it becomes so natural. And uh, now, right now, it's my favorite. I read something in the New York Times or any newspaper, and... You know, I go and I, and I look for the author and I share the information and engage with that conversation and you see hundreds of people talking about and it's Sunday and everybody's having a coffee and you're all talking about the same thing. So it's just in the moment, right? And sometimes I, I just joke with my husband and I said, he's reading something to me and I grab the phone and he's like, are you tweeting before I'm tweeting? And I'm like, yeah, too late. Because, you know, I just want to just engage with other people's what they are saying. Um, I love Instagram, but Instagram for me is all about an image. It's very difficult to put content there, thought leader, uh, you know, to drive people to something. Could be a blog or could be a an article in a newspaper. So for me, Twitter is is the number one channel. And um, let's see, Tammy, do you agree? Is that uh, Twitter your your favorite channel? Uh, where personally for me, um, Twitter and Twitter and Facebook. I also really like the uh, the communities that you can build on Facebook. Um, is it a little bit of a, a? I think I think people on Facebook tend to read their newsfeed and and know their communities. Whereas Twitter, you know, the newsfeed, you know, as you're as you're following so many people and so many people are following you, um, can be a little bit more sporadic in terms of you know. Um, the people you're able to follow, I and mean, you could, of course, do lists. But I do think it's getting harder, um, you know, to reach out above the noise on Twitter because it's such a crowded, you know, it's such a crowded, popular network. Um, so we're also doing more, and we're finding more success as a brand on LinkedIn as well, um, where there's more, you know, there seems to be even more engagement around um, experts on particular topics and um, finding the right communities to engage in uh, as a brand as well. Yeah, especially yeah. In LinkedIn groups. But go ahead, Jeanette. No, no, I was gonna. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think Twitter gives you the the biggest reach to jump in. And for us, um, since our users are all over the world, Facebook is is a really big one for us, especially in Europe and and Latin America. Um, and I and I love what we're seeing with the you know the visual medium with Instagram when we're doing contests and images and and engagement. Um, you know, it's really exciting to see the level of creativity and the user engagement we see when we do something on Instagram. So I think, you know, we're definitely seeing the challenge of brands are going to have to think a lot about visual first. And a lot of our users are looking on the mobile device and, you know, stro scrolling through Instagram on mobile is really, is really powerful. Um, but it's interesting. I definitely am, you know, using Instagram, but I feel like the next generation of workers are more comfortable all over Instagram, right? And um, so we have to think about the digital natives as they're coming into the workforce. They're very visual and, and sharing differently. So here's a here's a question from uh, Michael. Do you what do you think? What do you all three as conversationalists believe in um, that will happen to email? Well, I don't think email is ever going to go away, but I think people are trying to find ways to manage it. I'm certainly seeing a lot of apps to manage your inbox better, but we've been talking about email going away for like 15 years, and it's not. <laughs> but I, but I do think we're um, getting better at how we use um, all of our internal communications to collaborate with employees. So I'm seeing that you know, at my company on using email, like using collaborative tools like Yammer to be able to have those engagements um, and try and do less with email, but yeah, I don't think email's going to die, but I'd love to hear what other people say. I, I actually, for my out of office, I always put, if you want to reach me faster, then tweet me. Um, <laughs> it's totally true. I really, I really will answer a tweet faster than I'll answer email, and I don't know why I'm that way. It's a yeah, sickness of some that. kind. I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> Lorena, what, what's yours? What do you think about email? You know, I agree. I don't think the email's going to go away, but for me, emails is to get things done. 
mm-hmm. you know, do I have, do I need to do something? I go and do it, but it's not really for, you know, engaging a conversation or anything like that. It's just a, let's just get this done. And um, I'm with you. If someone want to just get me, they tweet me, they text me, they just stop <laughs> me. I know. And they go to, I mean, they go different ways, but they know that they're going to get my attention in Twitter. Yeah. But, they use bat signals, um, homing pigeons, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, and then you're busted, right? You're skiing in Tahoe, and then, oh, I thought you were in a meeting. Busted. <laughs> Tammy, um, you, I mean, you should, you represent an, a brand that just brought out. Kind of, this is a kind of a cool question for you because your brand just brought out a, a, kind of an answer to this. But what's your personal view? Yeah, it kind of combines all of the, you know, sort of your social networking um, internally and externally and, um, and and helps you to, um, I think, I think have a more social version of email is the idea. Um, and that's IBM I, terms, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, I think, um, you know, I think it is important to bring in those social elements into, I think this is sort of the, the thinking, right, to bring in those social elements into um, how you work. So we try much more to use, you know, portals and um, a video chat. Our, our corporate messaging system actually now has a video chat on it. So you can just, you know, rather than text somebody who's online or in your network, you can just pop up a quick video or an instant meeting. And just having that as a as a network is it's just so much. It's it's just better. It's more. Um, it's just much more engaging to have, especially we're such a global company. I spend much of my day with people around the world, and so being able to really see them or collaborate in a, you know, using a using a social tool or a collaboration kind of a network is um, is a much more powerful way I think to work, and it's making a difference. Mm-hmm. Well, we we have another converse, uh, Sorry, another question from uh, uh, from Joey. He asked, "Conversationalists are brand champions and also industry thought leaders, but do conversations with competitors ever conflict?" If you're if you're a conversationalist and a competitor reaches out and, and wants to ask a question, is it a, is the response appropriate? I mean, you are a conversationalist; it's in your nature to reply. Do you reply? I, I think the nice thing is yeah. to move. Why don't we move over to Lorena? Um, Lorena, what do you think about um, that? When I mean, you guys are working for some pretty big brands here. So, what happens when that that um, outreach happens? And you, obviously, you want to engage. You want to be a conversationalist. Yeah, so um, we are, as Tammy was mentioning, sometimes you compete, but sometimes you partner, and sometimes you are also a customer. So we're very careful about engaging and how to engage and who need to respond and respond what. Uh, we usually just send an email between the social media team and the person connected with that product, and then we make a decision what to say and or when where to point, because also sometimes you know you don't want to grab grab people's attention to the wrong subject or start something that, you know, should have not even uh, started. Right. So sometimes we decide, you know what, we're going to let it go. We're not going to engage in that conversation because we know that it's not going to have a positive end. And I think that Twitter and social media in general is all about positive. Yeah. So um, I will say that we craft it as a group and we make a call and, um, you know, it takes seconds because we're all just looking the same thing. So mm-hmm. we're all, you know, paying attention. And that could be, you know, globally. Uh, something can be happening in EMEA or Asia Pacific, and we're all kind of like engaged one single group looking at all of this. Great. Uh, great. Good answer. Um, uh, Jeanette, what, what about yourself? Well, I think um, Tammy mentioned a good point that, you know, we're all – we're all people and we all work for different companies at different times so I think in general it's being respectful and professional of everybody and if someone wants to pick a fight then maybe that's not the time to jump in on a fight and to like you know we might see something that is more product or feature related so we'll forward that on to our support team to engage in a discussion if someone wants to know about features Um, but I think you know for me I think um, Part of my guiding principle is, I think, overall, any comp- any kind of conversations opportunity to say, is this something that I need to correct the facts? Are these facts wrong? Or is an opportunity to transition it to someone else in the company to respond? But, um, you know, I think you have to look at it on a case-by-case basis. 
So I'm going to ask a question here. There are other questions, but I just wanted to make sure that um, this one kind of got addressed. Um, you know, I just wrote about this uh, new terminology called invective marketing. Um, it's uh, where somebody um, becomes a thought leader. They become a uh, person that has a large following, uh, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or wherever it is, and they have they have they have the numbers. They've got a hundred thousand. They've got two hundred thousand Twitter followers, and um, and 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 now they can shout from the rooftops anything they want. Um, they and and they t uh, typically invective marketers are not nice. They're um, they're either angry or combative or uh, want to debate. Um, and th this is happening more and more, and and it's harder for brands or people to um, debate people that have large followings, at least in numbers. Um, to and 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 you might call them um, uh, uh, you know bullies or or whatever, but they have this following. So as people start to build this um, social credibility, if you will, uh, that we've all pointed to as being a numbers game um, more than anything else, unfortunately, um, how, how do you see that working? How do you see trolls and the social trolls and social bullies that have credibility, that have the numbers? They're not just everyday tweeters, but they're actually out there combating a product or you. How do you address that? Um, do you ignore it or, or do you address it? Where do you see it heading? I'll, I'll jump in on one thing yeah. and say one of the things that we look at is for the community. That's where your fans come into play and where your community can support you. So instead of the brand jumping in, I would, you know, we often take a step back and see who's going to jump in um, that's, you know, in our industry or, you know, can help respond. Because I think people can see through that, even if they have a large following. If they're bullies, they're bullies, and they're not going to be swayed either way. So I think um, we have, you know, sometimes we'll reach out to our ambassadors if they want to comment, but we'll take a step back and watch and see if it's appropriate for us to engage. But I think those people, um, I, you start seeing in things being self-policed where people realize, hey, guys, tone it down. That's not appropriate. That's not the right forum for this conversation. Great. Thank you. Lorena, how about yourself? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, sometimes we have seen a couple things happen, and again, with the social media team and all uh, group, we decide, let's just hold it. Someone else is going to jump in and you know give an answer, and, and it's going to have more credibility because it's coming from the user community or from our partner community or someone who is just you know, can respond in a different way. Yeah. So we let you know, a couple hours pass or minutes, we know that we're so used to now with Twitter that need to, people need to answer like in seconds, right? But we let it just sit there and see how this is going to be developing, right? Because you don't need to jump and, and, and the brand needs to own and respond everything. You can let your partners, you can let your customer, your community to just, you know, be your champions out there. Great. Tammy, how about yourself? I think we have, I think Tammy has like... You can't hear Tammy, unfortunately. You may have to come back to her. Um, Tammy, if you want to lower or adjust your bandwidth down one more time, that may help. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask. I'll swing back around to Tammy, and um, and we'll. Add, I think we've just got five minutes here left. So one of the things that um, that uh, I wanted. Oh, I, I have a question here from Lynn Abate Johnson. It's a great question. What is the day in the life of each of you? What does your day consist of when it comes to uh, conversations? And I, I'll, I'll extend that a little bit because Twitter has uh, 140 characters, so she can't ask a full question. Um, but but as it pertains specifically to conversing online, how much time do you dedicate every day to doing that? Um, Jeanette, that's, do you want to start? That's a good idea because I feel like I pop in and out each day. I definitely – so a couple things I do is I um, – I'll check in definitely morning, lunch, and end of day. So I definitely have check-ins, you know, first thing in the morning. But I'm kind of popping in and out all day. I work for social media companies, so that's I'm probably unique in that. I'm always trying to be online. But I also schedule messages for the next, like, week or two. So we look at what's going on, and that really helps me as far as scheduling content ahead of time and, and also being uh, recognizing um, time zones. And so I, I use our auto-schedule function, and I schedule 
content. So, f and and obviously, if there's an event or something like this going on, it's it's really a great opportunity to kind of capture that. So I will capture a stream, like for this hashtag, and then I'll follow that throughout the week and see if there's any other conversations that are coming up that I need to engage in. Great. So for me, organizing my dashboard um, is great to be able to keep track of those conversations and what do I need to engage on. Man, um, being a person who works at Hootsuite, there's no um, no pressure, right? I know, exactly. <laughs> have to be on every channel all the time. But that's why workflow and routing work so well. And scheduling tweets. <laughs> Lorena, how about yourself? How much time do you spend um, each day on, on being a conversationalist? You know, I, I got the feeling that now I'm spending less time than before uh, because I try to go in conversations and out and I, I know what I'm looking for, what um, the people that I care, the topics that I care, where conversations are happening. Uh, I will say that I spend some time in the morning. I sometimes, I love to spend a lot of time w while I'm working out and I'm sitting down, you know, in my treadmill and then I, I'm doing it because it just seems like, you know, a, a good way to spend my time while I'm working out and, I'm, and I love to do that. I do jump from channel to channel, so I do a lot of research in our LinkedIn groups because we have a lot of community and conversations happening. And then I go and see what they're watching in our YouTube channels and what are, because I can see what, are, what kind of videos are grabbing their attention and watching over and over again. So that helped me to create a blog and then to tweet about it. So we kind of like dance between the, you know, different channels that we have that we create an, an ecosystem. So I will say that I spend, you know, solid like three to three hours a day, but in different times during the during the entire day. That doesn't seem like heavy because I also enjoy it and help me to get to know better my buyers and my users, my community and what they care about. So what they care about is what I care about pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I, I um I need to start working out so I can do that too. <laughs> I think it's um, impressive you're reading Twitter while you're on the treadmill. <laughs> I know. Talk about um. Trying to hold, hold Maybe just and, watching Instagram. <laughs> um, Tammy, uh, we did Tammy's uh, test run actually while she was at at the gym, so I know she works out. Um, <laughs> uh, so Tammy, what what? Let's. I think you're coming across now. So tell me, what is what is the day in the life of being a conversationalist like? What does that look like for you? Sometimes people ask me, why do you schedule treats, uh, tweets sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning? You know, like, what's your strategy? Uh, and uh, my, my strategy is that I, I can't sleep. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I don't actually ever schedule tweets, you know, and I, I do, you know, I do, I use Hootsuite more for, like, if I'm at an event and, or if I'm, you know, we're running a campaign. But personally, I, I actually use the, you know, the plain old Twitter app, and I'm sort of, Frankly, I'm a little haphazard about it, um, and I, I find I probably I do absolutely um, work to make sure I spend at least probably a half hour a day on on social sites. I, I love I love to look at Facebook and Twitter in particular, and and Instagram as well for for best practices in in brands. I look at all different brands and watch how they're driving campaigns and frankly, you know, shamelessly steal ideas when I when I find them. I, I find the industry is moving so quickly. It's a it's a great way to to kind of see the see the trends and, and see new ideas. Um and then um I don't know, I guess um as a for the brand, we run what I call a content desk, which is you know really understanding you know on a on a regular basis you know what what kind of what trends would tie into your brand. So what's hot in tech sector you know this month, and do we have a relevant play or a story? And we work with a team of journalists and you know um, to build both social content and more um, traditional content. And make sure that we drive engagement um, through um, by understanding, you know, what's what's hot, you know, that that week or that month. Oh, that's great. So it sounds like um, sounds like you're on social a lot, um, depending upon where the focus is. So it's not necessarily just on yourself, but it could be across the board, based upon IBM or yourself, or if it's three in the morning. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And I often tweet with you at three in the morning, so um, I'm, so um, <laughs> so. Thank I can't. You know, we we're out of time here, and I wanted to thank you three for being here and for sharing your ideas and your thoughts, and um, just taking the hour to be 
with everyone. I know they enjoyed it. The two stream is, is going off right now, and um, I'm sure you know if there's any questions that they point at you guys, you guys are the conversationalists, so they will hear back from you. Um, so, um, thank you guys so much. The, there, as I mentioned before to everyone, there are two more coming. Um, the uh, next two are uh, focused on the other two categories, which is brand champions and amplifiers. So the, that will be the next two categories. The next one will be in the uh, second to third week of January and then again um, uh, early February. So thank you all for uh, attending and, and again thank you guys uh, for being here and, um, and one final thank you to Leadtail who, uh, who did all the research and, and helped to sponsor this and really put a lot of time and effort into making, um, making, helping this to come through. So uh, thank you everyone. I appreciate right. it. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.